In December 1940, Albert Alexander, a 43-year-old Oxfordshire constable, developed a severe facial infection after having scratched his face while pruning rose bushes. As a consequence, he was hospitalized at the Radcliffe Infirmary in Oxford. The infection progressed despite administration of sulfapyridine until, on February 12, 1941, he became the first patient to receive penicillin for treatment of an infection. On that date, he was given, under the supervision of, among others, the 30-year-old Dr. Charles Fletcher, 160 milligrams, that is 200 units intravenously, of penicillin, followed by 100 milligrams every three hours. There was observable improvement after he had received a total of just 800 milligrams over the first 24 hours of treatment. The antibiotic, however, had been administered with some trepidation. Alexander had been chosen as patient number one after a not thoroughly reassuring experience with a single volunteer in what, uh, a sort of phase one trial that consisted of the administration of just one dose of penicillin. As Fletcher told a story in 1984, Howard Florey explained that although penicillin had been found to be entirely harmless to leukocytes, uh, tissue cultures, and a wide variety of laboratory animals, he did not want to risk giving the first injection to a healthy volunteer in case of some unique adverse reaction in man. So he asked me to find a patient with some inevitably in fatal disorder who might be willing to help. There were no ethical committees in those days that had to be consulted, so I looked around the wards and found a pleasant 50-year-old woman with disseminated breast cancer who had not long to live. I explained to her that I wanted to try a new medicine that could be of value to many people and asked if she would agree to a test injection of it. This she readily did. An injection of 100 milligrams, approximately 5,000 units, was administered via an antecubital vein on January 17, 1941, but was followed several hours later by a rigor and fever. This experience resulted in the demonstrated need for further purification of the preparation and removal of pyrogens before its next administration to a human, that human being Albert Alexander. While Alexander had demonstrated dramatic improvement with continued penicillin administration, after five days and approximately 4.4 grams of treatment, the entire supply of penicillin had been exhausted. The limited supply was the result of the difficulties in production, which was originally done in covered bedpans, but these had become unobtainable in England because of the war. The bedpans were supplanted by 700 flat bottom stackable ceramic vessels tended around the clock by penicillin girls, but the production problem remained. The exhaustion of the penicillin supply for Constable Alexander occurred, in fact, despite readministration to him of penicillin recovered from his urine. The urine having been transported by Fletcher every morning to the Dunn Laboratory for its uh, purification. When the antibiotics stopped, the infection resumed its inexorable progression. Constable Alexander died on the Ides of March 1941. Once the problem of its mass production was solved, penicillin use became widespread. In his December 11, 1945 Nobel lecture, Alexander Fleming warned of the danger of bacteria becoming resistant to penicillin as a result of its misuse. In fact, antibiotic resistance occurs with or without misuse as a result of the selective pressure on the bacterial ecology by its administration. The emergence of resistance may be rapid or slow, but it does appear inevitable. Among the infections for which penicillin proved to be life-saving was pneumonia caused by the pneumococcus streptococcus pneumoniae. The first evidence of the emergence of resistance of this organism to penicillin was not reported until 1967, after two decades of widespread use. The unfortunate patient from which, whom the resistant isolate was recovered suffered from hypogammaglobulinemia and chronic bronchiectasis and had, as a consequence, received multiple courses of antibiotics over her 
first 25 years of life. Penicillin also proved effective in the treatment of gonorrhea, but resistance to this antibiotic became prevalent somewhat faster than occurred with the pneumococcus. Staphylococcus aureus took a very different path to resistance. Penicillin resistance emerged as early as 1945 and had become pandemic within hospitals by the early 1950s. Currently, 90% of both hospital and community strains are penicillin resistant. The introduction of the semi-synthetic penicillin methicillin was followed within a year by evidence of resistance in 1961, and methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus is now pandemic in both hospitals and the community. In each instance, the widespread use of antibiotics uh, exerted a selective pressure that led to the emergence of resistance. In each case also, horizontal gene transfer, the transfer of genetic material encoding resistance from one organism to another, played a critical role. Also important in the emergence of resistance are mutations that affect the bacterial targets of antibiotics. Whatever the mechanism, the general effect of antibiotics is the same. The exertion of a selective pressure that provides an advantage to resistant clones by allowing their survival while their antibiotic susceptible neighbors are inhibited or killed. It is not surprising that the extensive use of antibiotics has led to the widespread emergence of resistance in a variety of organisms. In addition to the amp examples just discussed, clinicians are currently dealing with infections due to organisms such as vancomycin resistant enterococci, extended spectrum beta lactamase producing enterobacteriaceae, carbapenemase producing Klebsiella multi-drug resistant acinetobacter and pseudomonas, and others. Antifungal, antiparasitic, and antiviral resistance also is becoming more prevalent. In dealing with patients with infectious diseases, clinicians are caught between Scylla and Charybdis. On the one hand, withholding antibiotics when they are truly indicated may lead to the death of an individual patient, while promiscuous use of antibiotics accelerates their path to irrelevance because of the emergence of resistance. Unlike the case with other classes of drugs, every antibiotic use has a potential public health consequence. The goals of antimicrobial stewardship are the optimization of patient outcomes while limiting adverse effects on the patient and the bacterial ecology. In this course, we will present a comprehensive approach to an optimal antimicrobial use.